Good afternoon. We're going to start. Uh, my name is John Noriega. I'm the director of the Chicano Studies Research Center, and I want to welcome you all here and just say I'm personally delighted to be able to introduce Alicia Gaspar de Alba for this event celebrating the publication of her latest book, Unframing the Bad Woman, Sorwana Malinche, Coil Chalki, and Other Rebels with a Cause, published by the University of Texas Press. Now, I have known Alicia since my first year as a professor at the Department of American Studies in the University of New Mexico. Now, that was in back in 1991. Ernesto, you weren't even born yet. Uh, she was a doctoral student there, but was already known as a poet through the book Three Times a Woman, published in 1989. The late Yolanda Reta Vargas, our former librarian here, was also a student at that time, and I got to know each of them quite well. And they had a rather profound impact on me, including on my hairstyle and clothing, <laughs> such that one evening when I was meeting my department chair for dinner, she said in a rather droll voice, you're looking like a Chicana lesbian. <laughs> I didn't know that. For some reason, her statement was delivered and received as a compliment. <laughs> and I have to say, regrettably, my hair no longer supports the look. So it's, it's gone straight. <laughs> now, rather quickly, Alicia asked me to chair her dissertation. My first, and, well, hers too. <laughs> now, Alicia was interested in studying the Chicana, Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation, or CADA, exhibition that was traveling around the country at the time. And shortly thereafter, it went on display in Albuquerque. I had been serving as an advisor for CADA on the film component that was added at several venues around the country. And I was able to meet and befriend many of the artists. And so, a poet and a film scholar in a way, the two of us started together going down the path of learning about Chicano art. I only spent a year at the University of New Mexico before settling here at UCLA, but I continued as Alicia's co-chair. Her dissertation would win the Ralph Henry Gabriel Prize for the best dissertation in American studies in 1994. The revised version was published by the University of Texas Press in 1998, and it remains a foundational text in the study of Chicano art. I'm inclined to say that Alicia made me up my game as a professor, but that's not quite right, since I had just started the game. <laughs> so it is more accurate to say that she made me start my game on a high note. She also set a very high standard for all the doctoral students I worked with after her. I was expecting them to all win national awards. <laughs> I was thrilled when she joined me as a colleague at UCLA as one of the founding faculty of the Cesar Chavez Department of Chicano Studies. And I also benefited greatly from her contributions as CSRC Associate Director early in my tenure here as the director. Her tireless efforts brought international attention to the Maquila Dora murders and recruited Eve Ensler's V-Day and Amnesty International to the first na international conference on the issue here at the Chicano Studies Research Center. Now, Alicia has been extremely active as a scholar, publishing three other books, Velvet Barrios, Popular Culture, and Chicano Subject. Chicana O's Sexualities in 2003, Making a Killing, Femicide, Free Trade and La Frontera in 2010, and Our Lady of Controversy, Almo Lopez's Irreverent Apparition in 2011. She has published two collections of poetry and short, short stories, and has emerged as a major figure in Chicano literature with three novels, Sor Juana's Second Dream in 1999, Desert Blood, The Juarez Murders in 2005, and Calligraphy of the Witch in 2012. This body of work would be sufficient for the appointment of three tenured faculty members if it were evenly divided among them. <laughs> now, I feel like I'm missing something at the heart of this writer's work and impact. So let me turn away from her vita and toward her vida, or perhaps even her alma. Oh. Alicia, <laughs> I didn't expect that to be the injured puppy moment. <laughs> I was building up to a great political crescendo, but uh, <laughs> so let me just say, Alicia is committed to scholarly and creative work that makes a difference, but also to the work itself, its rigor and expressive dimension. 
There is no politics without art, and there is no art without politics, and they are not the same thing. So I feel like there's still something more to say, and let me just give you a little count of my late morning here. Uh, in preparing my remarks, I thought I would learn more about Alicia. So I went to her website at www.aliciagasparalba.net. <laughs> I was delighted to see that the top banner features her name spelled out in Scrabble letters. Now, in case you did not know, the Scrabble value of Alicia's name is 26 points. <laughs> the exact same number as the numbers of letters in the alphabet. I was starting to learn new things about Alicia. <laughs> now, if philosopher Jacques Derrida shifted attention from authorship to the signature, here the signature effect is less about naming a body of work, a large body of work, within which we can find stylistic and thematic coherence, development, and even paradoxes. Instead, it is about how the signature, Alicia Gaspar de Alba, does not so much produce language as it emerges out of and returns to language. But, as you all know, Alicia is bilingual. She is, as my good friend Carmelita Tropicana says, very good with the tongue. Coming. <laughs> where, keep aware of your mind's at. Coming, coming from, whoop, I've lost my page. <laughs> coming from a place that is multicultural, multinational, multigenerational, mucho multi, as Carmelita Tropicana would say. Now, with that in mind, I returned to the Scrabble letters that make up Alicia's name, and I looked for a hidden message. After a few minutes of arranging and rearranging the letters, the message appeared. Ay, dale gas palabra. <laughs> wow. For those of you who do not speak Spanish, this phrase means, Yahoo, give it gas, word. <laughs> or maybe a little more formally, OK, word, let's go. <laughs> Could anything be more insightful about Alicia? Ay, dale gas palabra. <laughs> Clearly, she is very good with the tongue, and she also has a way with words. Thing is, though, after I spelled out this phrase with the letters from her name, I had one letter left over, a C. And that's the first letter of my first name. So clearly this was a sign that I should introduce this wonderful and dear friend and colleague here today and let her come up and speak for herself. Alicia. <laughs> very much appreciate that introduction. This gets to the heart of a lot of things that uh, only people who know me well uh, can, uh, can actually speak to. First of all, let me thank uh, Sean and, uh, and the Chicano Studies Research Center for hosting this event. To me, it's a very super meaningful event because um, most of the work that is in this book uh, was created while I've been here for the last, uh, what is it, 20 years. Um, and so I'm very, very happy to be able to uh, present this book here in, in my academic home. Um, and I want to thank all of you, my students, other people's students, uh, old friends and, and colleagues, uh, and of course, my wife, Alma. That's why we all were going, oh, those of you don't know, that's my wife's name. Um, because, because your support and your presence means a whole lot to me. Um, I, for usually for these kinds of uh, events or talks, I have something more formal prepared, but it's always a little bit tricky when you're presenting your own work because you don't really know, unless you're reading from the text, which I will read from the text in a, in a second, um, or maybe a couple seconds, uh, you have this detachment, with, or at least I have this detachment with academic work. Those of us who write novels and poetry know that we immediately it, like bond with the text and it's really all about the story. Well, this is more about you know, my, my research and my career and my work here at UCLA and the different, um, different strains of that work and how it connects and disconnects. So uh, luckily I, had a, I have a wonderful um, PhD mentee, Gandhi, who did a great Prezi presentation on my book, from which I borrowed you know, today's <laughs> visuals. Uh, because she did a wonderful analysis and deconstruction of the work that, uh, that I'll get into uh, before I do my, my reading. Uh, the whole idea behind this book, and, and the reason that I put it together, 
is that I really took seriously a question that Betita Martinez, those of you who know her, you know, you know that she's a veterana of so many social justice movements, she's a dear, dear friend, uh, asked me at a reading that I did for Desert Blood. Uh, she had also attended a reading I had done a few years previous to that in San Francisco out of Sor Juana's Second Dream, which is a historical novel set in the 17th century about Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Uh, and then she attended the one on Desert Blood, which is about you know, the murder women of Juarez. And she asked me, how can, how can the same mind that produced the Sor Juana book produce this other book? You know, in other words, she wanted to know how do they connect you know, how was I able to jump genres th that way, jump centuries, jump all these different borders? And it was, a, it was a really interesting question because for being as obvious as it could be, um, I didn't know how to answer a question. I really didn't have it at, you know, the, the tip of my tongue. So it took a while for me to really be able to assess my body of work and, uh, and figure out what the connections were. Because yes, indeed, I wrote a dissertation on Chicano art, uh, then I published a novel on Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, and then I put together a, uh, an anthology on popular culture, Chicano, Chicano popular culture, and then a book of short stories, um, I mean poetry and uh, short essays, and then back to you know academic anthologies, and then the Desert Blood, you know, so I kept jumping around like that. And then the, the, the novel that I first started with when I lived in Boston, when I first conceptualized the Sor Juana story back in 1986, was actually Calligraphy of the Witch, which is the third novel that was published uh, in 2007 and then uh, reprinted uh, in paperback by Arte Publico Press in 2012. So here I'm dealing with the, the Witches of Salem, the Murdered Women of Juarez, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, um, you know, Chicano, Chicano art, Chicana feminists. I like all these things are living in my head. And Matita's asking me, what's the connection? So I had to think about it for a while. For years I had to think about that. And really, it wasn't until I decided, you know, I'm coming up on my 20th anniversary of teaching at UCLA. I really would love to see a collection of my essays published. Um, some new that I haven't published and some that I can expand because, you know, they've grown since they were originally published. And I thought, but, but they're, so, they're so different. And they're dealing with so many different things. How am I gonna connect them? What is the connective tissue? And uh, Alma and I were at an exhibit, I think it was a Leonardo da Vinci exhibit at the Getty Villa or something. And um, it was there that I realized, just by walking around, um, this notion of framing started kind of shaping itself in my head, right? Because I walked into this little niche where there was a, an unfinished drawing of da Vinci's. Saint Jerome. Um, uh, Wasn't it Saint, Saint Jerome? Yeah, Saint Jerome. Huge, but it was in a big gold frame in this space that looked like a chapel. You know, so here you've been walking around the exhibit, looking at all these little miniature like drawings and and different things of, of Dovich, and then you walk into this like chapel, and you almost feel like if you're if you're bred Catholic like I was. You know, you kind of have the genuflection <laughs> thing, you know? And you almost feel like genuflecting and crossing yourself. And you're like, oh wait, this is a museum and this is actually not a church. So, um, so then I approached, but it was really about the frame. It was that huge ornate gold frame that it was sitting in. And that changes the way that you look at a piece of art. So Alma and I got to talking about framing and I realized that, you know, really, um, what I had been calling the bad woman stereotype was a frame. And it was a frame that I could apply to all of the different subjects that I had been writing about for 20 years. And uh, really, that was uh, one of those moments where everything is like vividly imprinted suddenly in my mind. Aha! So that's what it is. It's this frame, it's this box. And then um, a, as we were talking, Alma also pointed out, but remember, framing also means when you blame someone for something that they didn't do. Yeah. And that was like, oh my god, that's so perfect. Mm -hmm. That's so perfect. Because the bad woman, she who does not comply with you know, the social constructions of her gender <coughs> and her sexuality is, of course, seen as the bad woman in 
patriarchy, right? And so Juana didn't comply, and the women of Juarez are accused and, and, and blamed for their own murders because they're bad girls and they don't comply. Uh, the witches of Salem didn't comply because you know they were also you know rebels with a cause or without a cause as they were seen at the time. You know, and Chicana feminists, the same thing. You know, Chicana artists who are you know, trying to do their own thing and not really wanting to um, you know, tow the, tow the sort of iconographic lines of, of the movement and the Chicano art movement. Everybody is stepping outside of these boxes and at the same time being held accountable for the ways in which they're blamed for doing something wrong or out of character or hating la raza or hating the family or whatever it is, right? So I thought, that's right, that's perfect. So now things are starting to shape themselves in my head. And then I was reading the New York Times one Sunday and I was looking at this piece about cooking or whatever, and it was not cooking, it was a, the food scene in Mexico City and the art scene in Mexico City. And all of a sudden there was this picture of all of these frames, there was a sculpture that there was a woman standing in front of, of all of these huge, ginormous frames in different colors, kind of stretching like this into the, into the landscape. And that was it. That was it. I thought, this is it. And I said, look at this. This is exactly what we were talking about. And Alma, of course, who's seen everything, says, oh yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> she says, I've been there. I'm like, <laughs> she said that's in, at the UNAM, at the University in Mexico City. Yeah, they have a sculpture garden, and that's a piece that's that's there. So of course, guess what? I had to get myself over to the UNAM to go and go into that space and really feel what that felt like to be in this inside of this like tunnel of frames, right? And in my research on the on the piece, I found out that it was done by a Mexicana, who, Mexican British. Uh, um, sculptor named Helen Escobedo, and she had titled that piece Coatl, as in snake in Nahuatl. You know, you can imagine how I felt then. So Gloria Saldua suddenly appeared, and the snake, and the shedding of, of, of identities, the shedding of boxes, the shedding of stereotypes, everything fell into place. And then you couldn't stop me. And that's why, Terry, I'm sorry the introduction is so long, because I just, that was it. You know, I had to just keep going. I, I had to follow that to the very end. And so that, all of that is a story of how all of these pieces actually connect to each other. But I'd like to, you, to see what uh, Gandhi did in terms of just kind of looking and breaking down some of the, some of the general um, uh, guiding ideas. One of them that I teach about, uh, one of the ideas I most teach about, is this notion about how when we think about identity, we um, are always thinking about uh, how we're different, right? How we're different. So identity and difference kind of go together even though they're paradoxically kind of uh, very opposite terms, right? But really what we're talking about here is the way that you see yourself is your identity and the way in which you're perceived is often a very different thing from how you see yourself, right? And I use, I use films a lot in, in, my, in my teaching to make you know, certain points, and I, use, uh, I love using Born in East LA for illustrating this, this particular aspect, because you know, here's, here's uh, uh, Chich Marin's character, right, who gets, who gets deported for, for being Mexican, right? and he's all, I was born in East LA, and you know, I went to Roseville High, and whatever, and um, and then he's like, "I'm an American citizen, you idiots, right?" And he just gets deported. And it's he is thinking of himself, his identity as the American citizen, but they're perceiving him as the other Guadalupe Rodolfo or whatever, and they throw him over the border where he belongs, right? So that's a really good illustration of, especially for Chicanas and Chicanos, how very often the way that we're perceived determines, you know, who we are for the other people, right? And, and it's often in contradiction for, um, for, with, with how we see ourselves. So this is why, um, right here it says, identity does not equal perception. And then if you uh, add patriarchal heteronormativity as a frame, right, for understanding gender, 
uh, and understanding gender for women, particularly, uh, it goes back to that notion of what I was saying, that we're framed by this stereotype uh, of the bad woman. Okay, so that is like, I, I love the, the graphic on that that you did. Um, so in the race, class, and gender hierarchy that we call hegemony, all women who refuse to abide by patriarchal dictates and the such social pecking order based on the rule of the white father are reflected in the social mirror as bad women. The bad girls and bad women that interest me as a writer and a scholar are the transgressive bodies who queer alter the male-centric history, politics, and consciousness of Chicano culture. So that you know basically is the overview that I was uh, that I just talked about. And then here are the different subjects of, of these essays. They're, they are all framed bodies, and they're framed within very specific imperatives: patriarchal imperatives capitalist imperatives, racist imperatives, imperialist imperatives, okay? And obviously, patriarchal imperatives implies sexual imperatives as well. So I write about Sor Juana, La Malinche, Kodoshauki, the Dead Women of Juarez, the Salem Witches, and Chicana Lesbian Feminists. Um, unframing the notion of un with a cute sort of postmodern bracket approach, um, which means framing and unframing, looks at how specific brown female bodies have been framed by racial, social, cultural, sexual, national, historical, and religious discourses of identity. These are all, of course, intersectionalities. That's the term that is popular nowadays, right? The intersectionality this and intersectionality that. Um, it's become kind of a buzzword, but it represents all of these different uh, parts of the puzzle. Unframing bad women uh, also implies rewriting their stories within a revolutionary frame. Okay, and uh, this is where you know she really went off on this on identity wheel, which I I loved. I actually loved. And so 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 uh, so Kendi calls it the epistemology of the bad woman. Um, a celebration of rebellious, revolutionary women in Chicana, Chicano, and Mexicano history, and a reinvention of their lives from a radical politics of recognition and social justice perspective. I employ an interdisciplinary methodology of the body that encompasses both sides of the brain to include fiction, poetry, feminist and cultural theory, mm -hmm. and critical analysis with the avenging spirit of the Furies. Okay, so that's uh, speaking about my, my method. Uh, just a word about the, the, the image that's on the cover. My wife painted it just for this book. Uh, she's doing a whole series of uh, luchadoras, Mexican uh, masked uh, uh, wrestlers, and, and uh, you know, she says there's not, there's not hardly any attention paid to Mexican female wrestlers, mm -hmm. so she wants to bring that, that history out into the open but also she's gonna invent her own you know, masks and her own uh, identities. And so this one that has, is wearing the mask with some attributes of Koyo Shauki, as you can see with the snakes and the bells on her cheeks. Uh, the star, I'm not quite sure why it's there, but I don't think that has to do with Koyo Shauki. But anyway, I like it. Her um, siblings. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right, that's right. The star represents the siblings who are the sen uh, Senson Huitznawa. Uh, the 400 southerners uh, and that's represented by the star that's right because they turned into stars it's just as she turned into the moon and uh, that particular um, mask or identity is called la rebelde okay so the rebel. The rebel. The rebel. The rebel so that that totally fits this whole epistemology of the bad woman and we're not going to go through any of the framing theory we just have to do this kind of thing. More friendly. I like that it's a cocktail glass because it's kind of making us do. <laughs> okay, genealogy of the bad woman, and I, this is one of my favorite parts of this uh, of this piece here because she has constructed this nice genealogy of the different subjects that that I'm writing about and put it on the timeline. Okay, so we have Koyo Shauki, uh, Aztec mythology, Machika warrior goddess. She represents the bad sister and the bad daughter. And we'll talk about you know, who she is in, in a second for those of you who don't know. Uh, La Malinche, uh, in the 1500s, 16th century colonial moment. Uh, she's a Mayan, de dispossessed noblewoman, translator. She represents the bad mother, the bad sister, the bad daughter, as well as according to um, the Mexican guru, uh, Octavio Paz, La Chingada. 
or according to um, Chicana feminists, la chingona. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, um, and that I quote, okay? So Juana Inez de la Cruz in the 17th century, uh, she's a nun of New Spain, she's a poet, essayist, playwright, genius. She represents also the bad daughter, the bad sister, and the bad virgin. Okay, La Llorona, this is a piece by, uh, um, by Delilah Montoya, another of Chon's protégés from University of New Mexico. Um, she represents, uh, well, she's a Mexican folk legend, weeping woman, she represents the bad mother and the bad wife. Okay, the dead women of Juarez are maquiladora workers at the El Paso Ciudad Juarez borderlands. Uh, they're uh, also known colloquially as Inditas del Sur because so many of them come from uh, southern towns and villages to work at maquiladoras. Uh, or even more uh, humiliating, Las Maqui Locas, right? Because they're maquiladora workers who are living according to the, that perspective, the vida loca of the border where they get to be free with their bodies and, and their sexuality. Um, and they represent the bad workers, the bad mothers, the bad daughters, and of course the bad Mexicanas because they're also, uh, they have the burden of representing the nation on them as well. Uh, Chicana lesbian feminists, and this is Alma's famous piece, Our Lady, uh, radical lesbian feminists and activists, scholars of color who represent bad daughters, bad sisters, bad scholars, bad activists, bad Chicanas, Bad mothers, <laughs> you know, they're just bad to the bone. Okay, or we, not they. Okay, and then here was this use of this is actually a picture of that piece, the frame piece. Um, I love how you know it looks like there's a hand holding that uh, that frame right there. Coatl as a symbolism for unframing, and uh, then here is the. Uh, the explanation, which I'm actually not going to share or to read with you all. If you want to read it, it's on page 33. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I do want to point out this bad woman, which is kind of in the middle of the, of the quote, this bad woman framework stretches back in Chicana Chicano chronographic memory and links La Malinche to Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, to the Chicana, quote, gender nationalists of the Chicano movement, to the so-called maquilocas of the U.S.-Mexico border, and even to the accused witches of Salem, because that bad woman stereotype is transnational, transcultural, cross-cultural, right? And it doesn't just exist uh, in, in this time and space. Uh, and then this is the process, the epistemological process of the bad woman uh, based on a methodology that, that, that um, in which we, we anchor our identities, our politics of location, um, and, and we use our experiences in our lives to theorize from. That's the base of our theory. So uh, a little bit of that, uh, what Shuri Moraga called theorizing in the flesh, uh, and, and also sure, as the Gloria Saldua calling it theory into flesh. And it's making teorias with a small T as opposed to making theory with a, with a capital T, right? So it's theory in the flesh and uh, flesh into theory. So from that politics of location, you move into that, uh, that unframing uh, praxis of undoing the heteropatriarchal framing of bad women. You take it apart, you, uh, you resist it, you deny it. Then you reframe uh, bad women as re revolucionarias or revolutionaries, those who are changing, those who are challenging, those who are transforming uh, our culture, our lives, our understanding of, of who we are and what, what our purpose is. Uh, and finally, this notion of revenge of the bad girls, uh, evidence of Chicana lesbian feminist uh, revolutionary love, and this is uh, actually alluding to um, not only Che Guevara, right? With with his uh, every revolutionary has to have has to be motivated by great feelings of love, but also our own Che Chela Sandoval, who uh, who said who said the same thing, and whose methodology of the oppressed is a methodology based in and on love. Okay, um, so that's all for this part of, of the. The, the presentation. The rest of it is, is really good too, and she's uh, taken apart all of the different uh, pieces uh, and, and, and applied that methodology to see how it works uh, in each essay. So a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Yeah, you did a great yeah. job. <laughs> so let me um, let me share what so what what one example of that unframing process uh, sounds like. Uh, I decided in analyzing um, these texts, especially looking at how um, how the women of Juarez, the murdered, mutilated, raped, dismembered women of Juarez, um, in many ways were like modern day Coyoshaukis. Coyoshauki being right, the dismembered, uh, beheaded sister of Huitzilipochtli and daughter of Kualikwe. And for those of you who don't know the legend, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be summarizing it in this piece uh, in, in a minute. But anyway, th that they represented that dismembered goddess. And part of my purpose in writing about them, part of my purpose in uh, creating this immense transnational uh, conference that took place here in 2003, was in fact to try to put their bodies back together, to try to give wholeness to them so that we're not thinking of them only as dead bodies, but as people who had lives and names and dreams and aspirations and families uh, and all of those things that constitute you know, agency and subjectivity, etc. Uh, so it, the conference itself included the mothers of like five of, or six of those victims who came and gave their testimonio about what had happened to their daughters. Um, and and the, the whole purpose, again, was to see how these bodies were being represented misrepresented and framed, and I was interested in unframing them, although that was not the language I was using at the time. Um, and so then thinking a little bit more about Goyoshauki, the legend of Goyoshauki, who is the primordial bad sister, right? I really started to see how this story needed to be rewritten. And given that I am a novelist, and I do use fiction for social change as well, I decided I would try to rewrite the Coyoshauki story. The legend of Coyoshauki, as it has been recorded in the Florentine Codex, and as it has been told and retold across the ages in the academy, as well as in the Chicano Mexicano community, is the story of, and I quote, La Maligna Media Hermana de Huitzilipochtli the malignant half-sister and mastermind of the plot to commit matricide and fratricide with the help of her 400 brothers. According to the legend, as it was written down in the Florentine Codex, when Coyol Schauke, also known as Bells on her cheeks, found out about her mother's unexplained pregnancy, she felt shamed by her mother's transgression, as though the mother had committed a grievous sin against her family. Why would Goyol Shauki and her brothers, the Senson Wisnawa, have issues with their mother's pregnancy? That was my first question, right? Why would pregnancy be seen as a transgression to a people that honored women who died in childbirth as warriors? Would such a society judge a pregnant woman, a venerated old woman at that, a bad woman or a bad mother for being mysteriously with child? It makes no sense, no matter what is written in the Florentine Codex, under the Catholic scruples and scrutiny of the evangelizing Bernardino de Sahun and his ilk, because that Codex was written by scribes, by native scribes, who were being converted to Catholicism. And their job was to sort of rewrite their legends, but rewrite their legends in such a way as to communicate Catholic beliefs. I agree with Grisel Gomez Cano, who notes in the return to Cuatlique, the logic of the plan and demand for matricide is murky, she says. Why would a daughter kill her pregnant mother? Many Mesoamericanists consider this legend not about murder, but about the personification of the struggle between the sun, moon, and southern stars and their mundane cults. Others propose that the theme of decapitation of Coyoshauki represents the annihilation of a female-led clan by the emerging patriarchal order ruled by a class of priests. The Immaculate Conception of Huitzilipochtli closely follows that of the Christ child. So Spanish missionaries could have rewritten this myth 
or influenced its native tellers. From a religious perspective, a major theme of this first aesthetic century was the replacement of a lunar with a solar religious ideology. The birth of a solar god signaled the Aztec's military expansion. He replaced the ancient agricultural moon deity known as Mesitli. Historically, this period could mark the emergence of the Mexica as an independent clan led by male warrior priests and the extermination of a female kinship led by the Mexica war lady, Coyoshauki. Okay, that was a long quote, but I thought very, very necessary. When we actually go to the Florentine Codex and read the story of Coyoshauki as it has been recorded in Spanish, we find an important element that never seems to make it in the re retelling. The treacherous little brother named Cuauhtlicac, who is the sole dissenter of Coyoshauki's plan to kill Cuauhtlicue and prevent the birth of their new brother, who will become the god of war, Huitzilipochtli. The three main characters in the legend are Coyoshauki, the bad daughter, in the mother and brother's eyes, Cuauhtlicue, the bad mother, in the daughter's and family's eyes, and Huitzilipochtli, the youngest but strongest of Cuauhtlicue's sons, destined to rule the Aztecs and the fifth son, El Quinto Sol. The 400 siblings, also known as the 400 Southerners or Sensonwitznawa, play a role in the story as well, mostly as textured background to the warrior goddess's gruesome tale. So what accounts for the mystery of the missing brother? When did Cuauhtlica get left out of the oral tradition? Why does he disappear completely from the story, although his name is inscribed in the Codex, along with the names of his older sister, brother, and mother? And his agency is the drama, in the drama was instrumental to the total destruction of Coyoshauki and Cuatlique. As the only one of the Senson Huitznawa named in the narrative, Cuauhtlica has a role in the unfolding of events as central as Coyoshauki's, for it is he who reveals Coyoshauki's plan to Huitzilipochtli, speaking to him through his mother's womb. So he's like, oh, shh, hey, what do I get it? <laughs> <laughs> and he helps Huitzilipochtli um, during, during the time of his birth uh, to be born at the precise moment that Coyoshauki and her 400 brothers storm into the temple. Huitzilipochtli's sudden, full-grown delivery from Cuatlicue's womb provides the dramatic twist to Coyoshauki's matricidal plot, and it is the sister rather than the brother who ends up being killed more than killed, La Hermana Maligna is beheaded, stripped naked, dismembered, her body parts kicked down the temple steps and humiliated for eternity. Cuatlicue's death, though never described in the Florentine Codex, is conveniently ascribed to the evil sister. I believe that Coyoshauki was framed. For nearly seven millennia, Coyoshauki has been blamed for her disloyalty and her anger, for plotting the unforgivable sins of mother and brother murder. She has been seen as the treacherous, rebellious daughter, the unmanageable, disobedient, moody, crazy sister who got what she had coming because of her own selfish interests and bad temper. Shuri Moraga and Gloria Saldua have both written about Coyoshauki and have reinterpreted her story within a Chicana lesbian feminist frame. Moraga writes that Coyoshaki's actions are political, not personal, that the warrior goddess, quote, <coughs> hopes to halt through the murder of her mother, the birth of slavery, human sacrifice, and imperialism, in short, patriarchy, end of quote. And yet, Moraga does not question the idea that Coyoshaki was attempting, in fact, to murder her mother. My interpretation of Coyoshaki is more aligned with Gloria Saldua, who sees her as, quote, a symbol, not only of violence and hatred against women, but also of how we're split, body and mind, spirit and soul. When you take a person and split up their body and divide her up, you disempower her. She's no longer a threat, unquote. Indeed, for Ansaldua, understanding the warrior goddess's actions as activism, as a response to a call to right and injustice, leads to what she calls Coyoshauki consciousness, one of the seven steps in the process of conocimiento, or self-knowledge. This call to action, however, can be a dismembering process. 
like the act of writing about the self. Quote, this process or struggle where a piece of experience is worked on, is connected to the soul, connected to making soul, you have to destroy, tear down, in order to put together and rebuild, unquote. For me, this process is also related to teaching, to helping draw out the Koyo Shauki consciousness in my students mm -hmm. through a keen and often painful analysis of their own lives and choices. So let me summon my storyteller skills here and try to rewrite and rebuild the myth from the perspective of another bad sister, a Chicana lesbian feminist who was invested in putting the pieces of Koyo Shauki back together. Long ago, in a sacred place called Cuatepec or Snake Mountain, Cuatlique, the mother of the gods, was performing her seasonal sweeping of her temple when she came upon a ball of bright blue hummingbird feathers which she picked up and nestled between her breasts. Stray feathers were dangerous, she knew, but at her age and after giving birth to 401 children, Guadlique <laughs> wasn't worried about the mystical consequences of a few floating feathers. <laughs> it wasn't long before she realized that she was wrong, for the feathers had, as feathers always did, mysteriously impregnated her. <laughs> the voice in her womb told her she was to give birth to Hummingbird of the South, or Huitzilipochtli, the sun god and god of war and sacrifice. Cuatlique summoned her eldest child, her daughter Koyoshauki, or bells painted on her cheeks, to the temple to give her the news of her pregnancy. Fearless and loyal and hot-tempered, Koyoshauki had chosen the warrior's path not the scribe or the priestess path, more common to the eldest child of a powerful goddess. Donansin, did you go out looking for feathers again? Donansin was the name Koyo Shauki and her 400 siblings called their mother. Kwadlikwe shrugged, I'm thousands of years old. How was I supposed to know I could still get pregnant? <laughs> and they were so tiny, nothing but hummingbird feathers. Who could suspect they would be so powerful? And they were so beautiful, too. Bright, iridescent blue. You know I can't resist beautiful feathers. <clears throat> yes, Donansin, but feathers are dangerous for you, especially the pretty ones. You always want to touch them and put them next to you. That's why we want you to stay inside the temple, so that the wind and the feathers don't find you and make you pregnant. <laughs> I didn't leave the temple, hija mia. It was right here while sweeping under Ometiotl's altar that I found the ball of feathers. Just like the time I found that long, single quetzal feather in the Temple of the Moon in Aslan, and it brought me you, my brave warrior daughter. Guadalique stared silently across the lake, remembering their peaceful life in Aslan, the trees heavy with white herons. She still could not understand what a quetzal bird had been doing that far north. If anything, it should have been a white heron feather that produced her eldest child. But that one had been second, followed by the eagle quintuplets and the gray owl twins. Did you hear me, Tonansi? I'm worried about this hummingbird, always moving, always hungry, and that long, sharp beak always taking the nectar out of the flowers. Is it a good omen or a bad omen? What a strange question, my daughter. You know there can be no good without bad, no light without darkness. We have lived in harmony for generations. Your reign during the sun of water has been good to us, and our people have grown fertile and strong, but lazy too, lazy and greedy. Now the time has come for balance, and the balance to all this fertility is war. For through war and the death it will bring to our people, will we be reborn. Your new brother has told me his name. He will be Huitzilipochtli, hummingbird to the south. He will be the god of war and sacrifice. War and sacrifice? Koyo Shauki removed her tur turquoise helmet, crowned with quetzales and marigolds. Our people are not warmongers. They're poets and artists and musicians. They study the stars and the planets. They grow flowers and cultivate fruits. Why would they make war when war is the opposite of what the Nahuatl is all about? The sun of water is one of growth, not death. Guadalique stroked the scars her daughter had carved into her cheeks when she chose the warrior's path. Now the scars looked like bells tattooed on her cheeks. The jagged nail of Guadalique's thumb caught on the rough skin of her daughter's face. A new sun is coming, my daughter the Nawi Olin, the son of movement. And this child I carry inside me will be the ruler of that new son, the supreme deity who must be fed with the ripe fruit of the human heart. 
If we fail to keep him fed, the fire will go out of the sky and the people will be plunged into darkness and despair. He tells me a great change is coming and that our people will have to move from Coatepec and find another place on which to build his temple. Build his temple? Coyo Shaggy rose to her feet, incensed at the idea of this upstart little brother. Who does he think he is? We already have a temple in honor of you, Tonantzin, our great mother. Does he mean to displace the great goddess of life and death? Does he mean to crush our serpent skirt, Quatlique, this hummingbird trespasser? Don't be jealous, my daughter. You're still the firstborn, and no matter what happens, the Quetzal feather will never be displaced in my heart. Jealous? You offend me, Tonantzin. I'm not thinking of myself. It's you who is being dishonored. How can you be so calm about this? The Senson Nguitz now are going to be very unhappy about the news. Our people wandered for more than two centuries since leaving Aztlan. They've been so happy here on Cuatepec. There is a prophecy that the people will be divided, said Patlicue. Those who follow Huitzilipochtli will travel for many more years until they find an island in the middle of a wide lake. On the island, they will see an eagle perched on a cactus, devouring a snake. That will be their sign that they have found their new homeland. They will kill, they will build a great civilization on this island with pyramids and temples and schools. And those who don't, ask Goyoshauki, what happens to those who don't follow Huitzilipochtli? Kualikwe turned her eyes away from her daughter's face. They will be conquered. Well, Shauki got to her feet, resplendent in her turquoise armor, her copper-colored skin turning silver in the last rays of the sunset. I won't let him do this to you or to our people, Donansin, she threatened, hand on the hilt of her obsidian sword. This hummingbird trespasser will destroy everything we have built for thousands of years. He will bring down the Nawiatl. He will sow conflict and hatred. He will wreak havoc and destruction. I will not stand for it. We must accept that life changes, Ikamiya. Every sun runs its course. Kwadlikwe tried to soothe Koyoshauki, but even the bells on her daughter's cheeks were flaming with a white rage. Her eyes glistened with angry silver tears. Kwadlikwe had never seen such ferociousness in her daughter, and it frightened her the depth of Koyoshauki's fury, which had turned her normally copper skin white as bone. Kwadlikwe felt a sharp kick in her womb. She doubled over with pain. Already, the child was fighting back. Leave me now, Kwadlikwe instructed. This conversation has tired me. I need my rest. Tomorrow, we will discuss how to tell your 400 brothers about the birth, and then they will have to break the news to the people. <laughs> that night, Kwadlikwe's wrath would not be quelled, and her body emitted a silver halo of livid rage. She paced and paced at the base of the temple, not realizing she had worn a groove into the red earth. She couldn't stop thinking about the prophecy, about the insult that was to be perpetrated on the great mother. If she didn't stop this travesty, it would mean the end of the fourth son. In truth, the solution was simple, but she couldn't carry it out alone. So she went to her secret cave and blew on her conch shell and called her 400 brothers together to tell them about the prophecy, about her ruse to kill Hummingbird to the south. She told them about their mother's pregnancy, about the birth of the god of war and sacrifice, about the prophecy that he would divide the people and bring death and mayhem into their lives. At first, the fury of the Sensonwisnawa matched her own. How dare he, that upstart, that maniac! Then, one by one, the heart went out of them, and they grew bitter and morose at the thought of having to leave Serpent Mountain. Koyol Shauki admonished them. Don't let your sadness defeat you, my brothers. We cannot allow this birth to take place. We must kill this hummingbird brother. It is the only way to protect Onansi and the only way to preserve our life on Cuatepec. And so Koyoshauki incited her brother's courage again, and they agreed to help her carry out her furtive plan. Only one of them, the scribe they called Huahuitlika, disagreed with Koyoshauki. He was a liar and a meddler, and Koyoshauki had no patience for his objections. She kicked him out of the meeting and didn't give him a second thought. As she turned her attention back to her other 399 brothers to plan her attack. Kwawitlika <laughs> ran to the Great Mother's temple and found her sleeping deeply on her petate. Quietly, he approached her swollen belly and whispered to his little brother the plans that her, their sister Koyoshauki and the Sesonwitznawa were plotting for his demise. 
A sound rumbled from the great mother's belly, and Kwawitlikak heard his brother's manly voice. Worry not, little uncle. I know what must be done. Why had his brother called him uncle? Did that mean one of the Sinsongwisnawa was the father? A son coupling with his own mother? Immediately, Kwawitlikak felt ashamed. Was it right to doubt his mother? Had he been right to betray his sister? Kwawitlikwa stirred fitfully in her sleep. From beneath her serpent-like skirts that wrapped around her in different colors, the young god was moving himself into position. Where are they now? asked the hummingbird brother. From the top of the temple steps, Kwawitlikak had a clear view over the valley and saw the cloud of warriors moving quickly toward Guatepec. They're getting closer. They're moving fast. Worry not, little brother. Where are they now? Now he could hear the whooping sounds of the Sensongwisnawa as they approached. They're almost here. Wake up, Donansi, wake up. Where are they now? Asked the unborn brother for the third time, still calm. Kwawitlikak heard the army of his siblings swarming up the temple steps. It's too late, he cried. They're here. He ran to hide in the darkest part of the temple. Kwawitlikak and the Setsongwisnawa stole into the temple like shadows. In the light of the full moon, slicing down from the opening in the temple roof, Kwawitlika could see that his brothers were fully arrayed for battle. Their hair gathered in top knots, their insignias pinned to their padded tunics. They wore long streamers of colored paper tied from their girdles, and bells tinkled from their armored calves. The barbed tips of their arrows gleamed with poisoned oil. Kwawitlika led the way, fully armored in turquoise, gold paint on her face and body, her obsidian sword raised high over her Quetzal feathered headdress. A strange white light emanated from her brighter than the moon. Kwawitlikak squeezed his eyes shut to block the horror of what was about to happen. Put your weapons down, he heard Kwawitlikwe say. How dare you raise your hand to your own mother? It is not you we are here to kill, Donansin, said Koyol Shauki. We protest the birth of the one you carry inside. It is he whom we will not allow to be born. But Kwawitlikwe could say no more for the pain churning in her womb was worse than all 401 of her previous births put together. She felt herself being cut open and pecked apart by the sharp beak, and she cried out to the Titsumini to come to her aid and ease what she knew were the death pangs of labor. Suddenly, there was a great quake in the earth below Kwatlikwe. Kwatlikwe would record later in the song of Huitzilipochtli how Kwatlikwe's screams shook the temple as the god of war exited from her womb. Nothing but a hummingbird, so small, he made Kwilshauki laugh. That's the great god of war? She taunted, swatting at the hummingbird with the tip of her sword and maiming the tip of his left wing. The Sensongwisnawa laughed with her. Instantly, the little hummingbird transformed himself into a full-grown god, taller than Kwatlikwe or Koyoshauki, his arms and legs painted blue, yellow war paint striped on his face, holding a shield of eagle feathers and wielding the fiery serpent Shiukwawatl like a thunderbolt in his left hand. In horror, Kwawitlikak and all of his brothers watched the mortal combat between Huitzilipochtli and Koyoshauki. Never had they seen their elder sister fight more fiercely, her obsidian sword deflecting the flames of the thunderbolt, her turquoise shield smashing down on Huitzilipochtli's withered left foot, the wingtip that she had maimed earlier. Hobbled, Huitzilipochtli let out a war bellow louder than the combined cry of the Senson Huitznawa. In one sudden move, quick as a hummingbird, Huitzilipochtli darted behind Koyoshauki and sliced off her head with one blazing sweep of the fiery serpent. Just as swiftly, he chopped off her arms and legs, pulled the breastplate off her torso, and exposed her naked breasts, and kicked her body parts down the temple stairs. He chased and killed all but a few of his 399 brothers, and turned them into embers with his fiery serpent sword. The survivors ran for their lives as far south as they could get from Guatepec, and were never heard from again. In her last moments of life, Kwadlikwe, greatly weakened from the birth and devastated by the carnage she had just witnessed against her firstborn, cradled her daughter's head to her breast, kissed each of the tattoos on her cheeks, and threw the head into the night sky to become the moon. She dragged herself to the embers that her other children had been reduced to, blew on them with her last breath, and set their immortal souls up to join their sister 
and the sparks became the southern stars. And that's where I'll stop. <laughs> being a novelist, you see, you get to play with, uh, with, your, with your research a little bit. Um, so, does anybody have any questions? I'd love to hear questions, comments, anything regarding anything. I'll talk about whatever you want. <laughs> it's kind of a lot to take in. I <laughs> It, it seems like um, you kind of discovered a, a pathway or a pattern, a repetition through a culture or several cultures. It's like a river flowing through life. Mm. And I'm wondering if you think there's a way to turn that around or turn that a different direction or correct it, or is it inevitable, like the way it flows? Mm. That's really a poetic. Uh, question. I like it. No, I like it. And I think that that's why um, I'm I'm talking about the unframing, reframing process, because I think that unless we're really conscious of the fact that we have these uh, boxes, these uh, frames imposed upon our being from the minute that we're born, right? <coughs> Gender is inscribed from the minute that you're born. Uh, that you don't question why this is the way it's supposed to be and why you can't do this other thing unless you're willing to do that work and constantly remind people that you know that this is not who you are and that you actually have the right to determine who you want to be um you know, we will that river will continue to flow in in that way and i think it it will continue to flow for many many more years until we have more and more of us uh, you know, standing on either side of that river going, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to swim in that water. Mm. You know, you have, but you have to be conscious of it. And so this is why I think it's so important and, and where Chicana feminism gives us so many tools uh, by which to do that analysis. Because it's not just an analysis of your culture and your, and, and, and your, and your family and your way of being. It's, a, it's an analysis of yourself. It's a self-knowledge, a process of self-knowledge. And, and appealing away all these layers of identity and false identities until you get to that place where you know who you are and, the, and understand that that place is who you are now, but that, that also is going to change, right? And, and Chicana feminism gives us those tools. Um, and, and it's not just uh, an intellectual tool. It really is very much about uh, what Luis Alua calls spiritual activism, right? Because it's a call to action that we issue to people who read our work or the students sitting in our classrooms. Like, this is where I've been, and, uh, and I know it's a scary place. I know some of the, my students in this room who have been through that process have gone to that scary place, but have gone over that bridge and have found something of extreme value and strength. Janet Napolitano. Is, or, or, is one that would change the course of the river, I, I think. Well, maybe, I hope. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Just mm -hmm. analyze that for a while. Okay, uh -huh. all right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, so with, um, what, is it, does that break away from what you, like when you said at the beginning about intersectionality, is that breaking away from that intersectionality, like where it's like you're already like these preformed like, um, identities like you're saying so are you breaking away from that and just creating your own path you know what I don't think that you can break away from intersectionality because um, I didn't I didn't show the picture of the identity wheel that Kendi was also really good about drawing for for the different pieces in the in the in the book but this identity wheel is a rubric that I work with all of the time to break down our own all of the different intersections that that come together in in the body in our body right um, and those will always be there because we are born into them we are shaped by them uh, we are we learn from them you know and so that's always going to be there but the questioning that happens is the questioning from the inside out as opposed to from the outside in, mm -hmm. right? So that you're questioning each one of those 
intersections, each one of those uh, identity uh, vectors, right? You're questioning, well, why is this so? Why is that so, right? I want to rewrite the narrative so that what, the, the kind of sister that I am, the kind of mother that I am, the kind of person that I am, you know, is not judged to be bad or useless or evil or maligna or whatever, because it goes against this prevailing dogma, you know, whether that's from, from, from our religious beliefs or cultural beliefs or, you know, political beliefs or what's represented on the mass media, because they all kind of work in tandem mm -hmm. to impose all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's taking a really hard, critical look at each one of those vectors of our intersectionalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can't, you don't do away with them, but you, you know, you do a critique and you understand how each one of them has shaped you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Carmen. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really pretty cool. Um, <laughs> oh, really? Pretty cool. <laughs> um, you know, what I, what I saw right now is um, how um, I think it's y yourself as the writer and the poet Right, the creative person who has over the you know the course of all your twenty some years of creating work have been um, a, be acting or reacting to work in that very intuitive artist way, mm -hmm. which is right. You see something, you react to it, and don't necessarily um, analyze it in that moment, right? But you know you know that oh, Salem witch trials so wrong. You know, uh, women of what is so wrong, all this stuff, right? And you react and you do this creative work, you know, Sor Juana, so wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you react to it in those ways, right, that are just so wrong. Or, and also as an activist, mm -hmm. right? So you're re what I see is a reaction to these, right, this history of women uh, as an artist and an activist. Um, and then, you know, as um, the academic, activist right then applying um, all these uh, feminist theories right like decolonial imaginary Chela's theory all these theories mm -hmm. to this work and so therefore then coming with this theory of unframing is really from that kind of first reacting you know creatively to this work and as an activist and then applying um, these uh, Chicana feminist theories right mm -hmm. to this to this work and then see and then coming with the, your own theory right but it's really uh, very much an activist theory mm -hmm. born from a creative work mm, thank right? you I appreciate that I, I totally appreciate that I always make a joke that my writer friends uh, like poet and novelist friends think of me primarily as an academic and my academic friends think of me primarily as a poet and writer <laughs> You know, so it's not it's like they don't really think of me within that framework that I, that they're coming from. They always see me as representing the other side. So I like that that combination, and it kind of speaks to my formation because I got a master's degree in creative writing at Harvard on the border, as UT El Paso likes to call itself, how huh, earning. Harvard on the border, <laughs> we like that. Um, I got a really good education actually at UT El Paso. It is one of those places that you know uh, people should get to know a little bit more intimately. But uh, but I got this great I, I thought formation in in poetry uh, and and fiction writing there uh, because there were writers who were really really good writers who happened to be doing something in their life and El Paso got in the way, you know, and so they were like getting over a divorce or uh, they're trying to get sober, which is not the place to go to if you're trying to get sober. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so they happened to be in El Paso just for like a year or two and, and teaching courses and so the, the learning and the praxis was, a, was amazing. So I never thought actually that I was gonna go on to get a PhD because I was very much committed to being a writer and a poet. Uh, understanding and believing that, you know, you can't make it out there in the world as a writer. You have to have a day job because nobody, especially nobody who identifies with and writes about being a Chicana, lesbian, feminist, 
you know, is gonna make the big bucks, right? And this was before Sandra Cisneros got, you know, broke that, that little window of opportunity uh, with her work and, and became, you know, this famous mainstream Chicana writer, but not lesbian, not feminist, you know, in, in all of the ways in which, uh, you know, in which I was producing. So I had to uh, mm -hmm. teach as a way of paying the rent. But I was fine part-timing, teaching ESL and um, English as a second language and how to write composition, uh, how to write research papers and, you know, just getting by because I had the most important thing, which is time to write. But then I started feeling like I really wanted to teach different kinds of courses. I was kind of tired about teaching how to write a sentence, you know, for like 15 weeks. To, you know, I mean, that's why, that's why, and I apologize to all of my students whose papers I return with all kinds of drawings, uh, comments, and remarks, and whatever. I can't help but fix your grammar and, and point out that you missed something because of the fact that this is what I used to do. I used to literally teach people how to write a sentence and how to write a paragraph, you know, and it's just something that uh, is just in intuitive to me, right? Um, but then I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to teach a course on, on uh, border writers, right? There's so many border writers and who come from this border. And wouldn't it be cool to teach about um, you know, Mexican legends and folklore and you know, all these things I couldn't teach because I didn't have those three little letters after my name. Um, and so uh, I decided, well, the only, the only thing I can do is, and I also had to escape from a bad relationship, so I had to apply for, uh, for some grants and got, get, got, got out of Dodge as fast as I could, um, you know, and got a, got a grant uh, to go you know, start a PhD in American Studies in Iowa, which was really an interesting experience. The only really good thing that happened in Iowa was that I met Gloria Saldua, and that is, um, that is the, the prologue or the preface to the book, is a letter that I write to Gloria Saldua uh, about that time, about how, what an impact it made on me to meet her and to actually see another Chicana feminist lesbian in Iowa. There were a lot of Chicanas, <laughs> but they were not all like you know, Chicana feminist lesbian from Texas, right? And she was all of those things, and she was throwing out her theory. She was finishing up the draft of Borderlands, and so she was trying out some of her concepts on us, right? So she was talking about she was talking about uh, mestiza consciousness and la facultad and the shadow beast and all that good stuff. And I was just like, oh my God, it was pure music to my ears. And everybody around the room was going, what the hell? <laughs> you know, they had no clue what she was talking about, right? And, and I, call it, I call it in the, in the letter, it was like, you know, they were, they were, they were witnessing, you know, some a, a, a big, uh, the emergence of a big, uh, you know, uh, one of those ma mystical circles that come out in cornfields. It was like one of those that just dropped out of the sky and landed in Iowa, you know? And that was Gloria Anzaldúa. So, um, so because of, of that, she gave me, she gave me hope because literally I was, I was gonna drop out. And I did drop out. I thought after the first nine months, I thought, I can't do this. I cannot sit around reading about another pioneer uh, about another, you know, Puritan. The only, the only thing I liked about the Puritans was the witch trials because it was all about the women. It was all about the, the, the persecution of the women, and uh, you know, but we weren't reading about that. We were reading uh, other things, and then the frontier and all of these things. I'm really happy I went through that now because obviously it informs my, my, my activism and informs my teaching. But at that point, it just made no sense to me, and I thought all I really want to do is write. I, that's it. So I dropped, I said, I dropped out of PhD school and, uh, and went to live the writer's life in Boston, you know, trying to get away from, uh, you know, the whole Anglo-centric life of Iowa. I went to Boston. <laughs> but that was, but that, a lot of times my choices are guided by relationships that I'm either trying to leave or trying to follow, you know? So at that point I was following somebody who'd gone to Boston. And so I thought, well, you know, I'll write. It's closer to New York, so maybe I'll even be able to work in publishing. You know, and at least I'll get that a little closer to getting a book published because I, I visualized it all. You know, I got I could get a job as an editor at a publishing house, and then somebody would read my novel and discover my work, and I'd be famous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did end up getting a job in publishing, only it was at a Braille press. 
<laughs> and I didn't write in Braille. <laughs> you know, but I did learn how to read Braille. And people, sighted people read Braille not with your fingers, but with your eyes. You learn what the little dots represent. You know, and it was kind of a cool job. Um, I mean, but like every job, eight to five, it can get really boring, right? So the little bolitas on the page were interesting, you know, and, but then when, when you realize what the blind were being given to read, really boring, ultra conservative stuff, it was like, oh my God, poor people, you know? You can't read good stuff, you have to read this trite. But then I got, I got uh, hooked into uh, doing children's books. And then, that, then I was happy again because I got to transcribe children's books into Braille. And that was cool because in children's books they leave the original page uh, and, and they, have, they put the Braille on a, on a clear plastic page so that the parent, or the sighted parent or whoever might be reading the story to the blind child uh, can describe you know, the picture. And so they're actually very beautiful books, you know? And, and so I was really proud of those books. I was really happy to be doing that, but not making very much money and all, you know, needing to get another job. I decided I had to go back to part-timing and doing what? Teaching ESL, how to write sentences, and how to write paragraphs to all kinds of people from all over the world uh, you know, who did not write in English. And so I taught at uh, UMass Boston for like three years. The cool thing is that that is where I came up with the idea for both the calligraphy of the witch novel and the Sor Juana novel. And it just so happened that at UMass Boston, as well as at the Boston Public Library, which was my other home, uh, they had the, um, all of the transcripts of the witch trials, you know, archived. And uh, uh, those were the days of microfilm and microfish. Who here is old enough to remember <laughs> microfilm and, and going like with this big old thing, cranking the thing and, and seeing, well, anyway, so it was, it, it was a lot of fun to do that archival research. And it was because of that, really, that I was able to, um, you know, immerse myself into writing uh, the, those novels. At that point, it was going to be one novel, and then it developed into two novels. So, you know. That was a very, a very productive period. It was while well, I lived in Boston, I lived there for four years, that I wrote the manuscript that uh, would become my short story collection. Uh, I finalized my poetry collection, I, and I did the first draft of the Sor Juana novel and the first draft of the Calligraphy of the Witch novel. So yeah, it was, it was a pretty amazing place. Um, I think it's just because I was in culture shock and I just needed to stay home. But, uh, but, but it was good. And then I realized, no, you know what? I still want to teach these classes. I still have this PhD that I started. And I actually really do miss the, 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 the Southwest. So I, I looked around to see what university uh, in the Southwest had an American Studies PhD and which one would take my year in Iowa, because that was very important. I didn't want to waste that year. And University of New Mexico fit the bill. And so I applied to the University of New Mexico, the only one I applied to. I figured I'd get in, and, uh, and yeah, so I got in, and the very first quarter or semester at the time, uh, I found out that Chono Diego was going, you know, was going to teach there. And there you go, <laughs> to this moment. <laughs> I know, exactly. Exactly. So I don't know if that said anything at all about what you were saying. I think I stepped out that part. I'm summarizing the preface, by the way, so you don't have to read it anymore. <laughs> yes? Um, well, actually, that said a lot um, related to hey, my question. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, Alicia. Hi. It says a lot because my question is around the epistemological process of bad women. Uh -huh. And so hearing what you just said really tells the... Um, your worldview, that experiential knowledge. Uh -huh. And I'm really interested if you could talk a little bit through those four, the methodology of politics, location, unframing practice, reframing resolutions, and the revenge of bad girls. I'm teaching a Chicana Latina feminist methodology course. Uh -huh. And so taking this, you name it as an epistemological process, but how that becomes a methodological process when you're doing research mm -hmm. with live people with kids with youth and its relationships to decolonial imaginary to differential conscious but also the coloniality of that that to me sounds like the unframing praxis right Just any kind of give me more on those four give you more give you more um, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah no um you know it's interesting because 
I, I don't really know if I called it the epistemology. I think that might have been Candy who called it an epistemology because for, I, I've always seen it as a methodology. It is definitely a methodology. And when Betita asked me that question, she was asking me the question of, of methodology. How did you do this? How did you get from this point to th that point, right? And so um, in analyzing, I mean, it's really actually something I recommend to my colleagues who, who are in the room who have you know written a lot of different pieces to look over those pieces with with a, like try to uh, approach it as though you were you know doing critis uh, a critique of somebody else's work right uh, really do some detachment uh, exercise and um, and analyze that methodology and see how the methodology is repeating itself uh, in all of the different pieces and over and over. I saw that I had all of these different pieces that had been published in different um, uh, journals and, and whatnot and, and anthologies that did that very thing. And the pieces that didn't do that very thing, I left out. You know, because like this doesn't include my, all my, 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 my essays, but it includes the ones that, you know, fit into this framework. Um, and I, because I teach decolonial imaginary and I teach differential consciousness, mestiza consciousness, and I've been doing that, you know, assiduously and consciously, uh, deliberately for uh, all my life, and certainly all the 20 years that I've taught here. Um, I kind of breathe those theories and breathe those methods, you know, and I vouch for them because I practice them and continue to practice them in my own work, right? And so, if you get students engaged by being engaged with their own bodies first, i.e. the politics of location piece, they, they can immediately then find that they are subjects of their own story, right? And explore subjectivity, their own subjectivity, by then contextualizing and decontextualizing their lives inside of these different <coughs> theories. So it becomes that kind of process that's both creative, but also really cri critical. And it gets you to exercise what I call, and w what you were talking about the other day, the I, I, you know, the I, I epistem, I mean, the uh, methodology. I as in I am, and I as in the eyes that you see with, right? Because to me that equation shows how what we see, which also means what we, you know, know what we learn um, is filtered through our bodies. It's filtered through our experiences and our voices. And I'm one of these people who will grade you down if you don't use the I voice in my classes, right? Everybody knows that? Everybody here who's got a lower grade because they didn't use the I voice, raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> you know? Because the I, well, I always say academia, you know, reduces us to these like machines that have no subjectivity, even as we're writing about subjectivity and we're writing about agency, you know. And here we are removing I from the equation and talking as if we were some kind of third person robot, you know. And it's in the rubble of all of that uh, that we've been taught from from I think grade school on, but certainly high school on, uh, that you're not supposed to put your, yourself into the piece, you know, that you have to actually see that that practice kind of is a murder of, of your soul. Mm -hmm. And people are so afraid of putting the I voice in there that they don't even write in their journals because they're, they're just afraid of what it means. And, you know, I do a lot of free writing and, and, and that kind of like uh, five minute uh, instant writing exercises in my classroom around a particular reading or theory or whatever, and you know I don't uh, I pull, I have to be like a, like a drill sergeant right because some students are so afraid that they don't even want to put their pen to the page because they're afraid they're going to make a mistake again because it's been hammered into us that there's a correct way and an incorrect way of writing right and that the I voice is definitely the incorrect way. So you've got to break down those politics of location. Once you do that on yourself, then you can you know, feel more comfortable doing it with other, uh, the other people that you're reading. 
I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. Okay, good. Anything else? Well, it's 4.30, my wife tells me. <laughs> and uh, let's, uh, let's go and have some coffee, sandwiches, and everything else. Thank you so much. Thank you.